what a great privilege and honor to uh, give you 15 minutes about osteoporosis. So when Steve called me, he said, uh, the good news is you're, you're going to give a little talk about osteoporosis. The bad news is you only have 15 minutes, and that's impossible for me. So I immediately scurried to uh, call my colleagues, and I want to acknowledge some people who contributed slides, some of which I put in and some of which uh, we had to leave out, but people like Steve Teitelbaum and Sandeep Kosala and Steve Cummings and Eric Orwell, who sent slides and contributed to this talk. So thank you very much. It's really uh, a pleasure to tell you that we've made great progress, as Francis said, in both understanding the pathophysiology and the treatment of osteoporosis. And in these last 25 years has been very exciting. Osteoporosis is a devastating disease that affects about four, 40 million individuals and costs our healthcare uh, estimates at $19 billion. And most of this is related to this tremendous uh, impairment in mobility, um, the difficulty with quality of life, and of course the presence of hip fractures, which can subsequently lead to not only uh, confinement into nursing homes, but also uh, into uh, individuals dying from uh, coincidental uh, morbidities. So what is osteoporosis? Well, we do have a strong definition. It is a disease that is associated with microarchitectural deterioration, which leads to impaired bone strength and fractures, uh, frequently with very minimal trauma. Now, one of the great contributions to the field was started back when NIAMS was started, and Francis alluded to this, and this is the study of osteoporotic fractures. And this cohort continues 25 years later with almost 6,000 women. It started with over 9,700 women over the age of 65, funded by NIAMS and the National Institutes of Aging, with over 2,500 citations and 375 papers. Their seminal work, which is contributed by many, many investigators, in defining risks for osteoporosis. And as Francis said, we now are able to successfully identify those people at greatest risk, not only by bone density, but also by the number of risk factors. And this has been incorporated into clinical practice in what we call the FRAX uh, database, so that practitioners can dial in risk factors and bone density and produce risk to define who is at greatest risk and who we should be treating. But not only is it a disease of women, but it is also a disease of men. And back in 1999, NIAMS, along with NIA, supported the study of, oste of osteoporotic fractures in men, subsequently called Mr. Oss. And this study now is in its 11th year and has over 113 publications and nearly 6,000 men that they are following longitudinally. And two major discoveries from that group out of many, many are that one, that obese individuals, especially obese men, tend to have the greatest risk of fracture, which is somewhat of a surprise, but is an emerging area of investigation. And two, that rib fractures are an early indicator in men of subsequent osteoporotic fracture risk. These are both items that um, we hadn't considered previously when studying cohorts such as Mr. Oss. Now, the other area, and Francis alluded to it, and Steve has been a big, and Joan, a big supporter of this, is our area of understanding microstructure and of imaging the skeleton. And these are some images using extreme CT in which we can look now at the inner trabeculi of the skeleton. This happens to be in the tibia. And you can see the difference between a 24-year-old female and a 71-year-old female, particularly the thinning of the cortex, this thick area that lines the outside of bone, as well as the trabecular disarchitecture that occurs with osteoporosis and with aging. And through lots of studies at different uh, sites, particularly the Mayo Clinic, but UCSF and Columbia, we've begun to understand that age-related bone loss begins early in life, not just at menopause, not just at a magical age of 65, and that this bone loss is incessant and is related to many factors, not the which of is hormone-related. Uh, 
But some of the areas that we've really spent more time and got started a little later on is the genetics of osteoporosis. And we now know, and it's been established for a while, that genes contribute 60 to 70 percent of your peak bone density, which you gain between the ages of 10 and 20 years of age. This big black box was really un untapped for a long time. And the theory was that if we could identify genes, we might be able to start very early in the process, particularly with environmental interactions such as calcium and vitamin D, to modify subsequent risk. As it turns out, uh, the, the secret was really unlocked through uh, some surreptitious uh, studies and some very hard work looking at diseases, rare diseases that occurred. This is uh, work from the Warman Laboratory at the Cleveland Cl at Case Western, and they discovered that in osteoporosis pseudoglioma, which is a disease of one in two million individual children, gets severe osteoporosis and an inflammatory retinitis that leads to blindness. Uh, and they were able to map this uh, disease to uh, uh, a region on chromosome 11. At about the same time, Bob Recker and his group at the uh, Creighton identified just the opposite, a group of individuals with very high bone mass and resistance to fracture. And those individuals were also mapped to uh, a region on chromosome 11. As it turns out, in one of the most seminal discoveries by many investigators, some who were in the room, it was discovered that both the mutation that caused osteoporosis pseudoglioma occurred on uh, an uh, extracellular receptor, the LRP5 receptor in propeller 1, uh, blade 4, and that the gene for uh, the high bone mass was also identified on this same extracellular receptor, uh, the LRP5 receptor, which uh, uh, had a high bone density and was related to those pictures that you saw. And this breakthrough was exciting not only because we identified the cause of a rare disease or two rare syndromes, but also because it opened the way for our understanding of a major cellular pathway for the formation of new bone, and that is through the Wnt LRP5 signaling pathway. And this discovery has led to thousands of publications and more work both at a basic level but also at a translational level, trying to design drugs that might be bone specific to stimulate new bone formation without changing the activity in other tissues. So this has been uh, work that's ongoing by a number of different uh, investigators. Now, you heard a little bit about the genome uh, study and the work uh, from Francis talked about. Uh, when we came to trying to identify genes that were related to osteoporosis or bone density. We started with mice, but at the same time, there was a huge effort in humans. And this slide from Doug Keel just emphasizes the importance of the inter-institute interdigitation that occurs in bringing large cohorts together to try to get power to identify common disease gene polymorphisms. And not only in the United States, uh, looking at the cardiovascular study and the Framingham Heart Study for skeletal genes that affect fracture and bone density, but also through GFOS, which is a European and international collaboration, bringing together the significant power we needed to identify genes related to bone density. And in this slide, you can see that not only was LRP5 very important and the gene for OPPG and for the high bone mass phenotype, but also turns out to be a very important uh, gene in which polymorphisms are related to bone mineral density. So that we have the entire extreme of low to middle to high bone density related to a single gene that was discovered from rare disorders and sponsored and focused from the NIH. Not only does NIH support pathophysiology and basic research, but also clinical studies looking at new treatment options 
This is work published in New England Journal from Dennis Black and colleagues showing that parathyroid hormone alone was as good or better than combining parathyroid hormone with uh, bisphosphonate, in this case, alendronate. And this set the standard for clinical treatments in osteoporosis by uh, people around the world. Not only that, the NIH is interested, and NIAMS is particularly interested, in innovative new approaches to treatment. So this is work from Clint Rubin and his group at uh, State University of New York at Stony Brook. He started vibrating turkey wings uh, back in the late 80s and then graduated to sheep and through uh, low amplitude, high frequency sound waves, he was able to show that you could protect the sheep from ovariectomized induced bone loss. And this was a very impressive response that was duplicated in mice as well. And this has led to a clinical trial several small uh, clinical trials, but a very large trial sponsored by NIA, looking at the role of high, uh, high frequency, low amplitude um, vibration on protecting bone density in the elderly and possibly reducing fractures. Finally, uh, Clint noticed it, and several of us had noticed that there is this relationship between obesity and osteoporosis. And seminal work from Gerard Carseni, Tom Clements, and others have shown that bone is more than just a structure that holds up our protoplasm, but also is an endocrine uh, secretor, and that the hormone osteocalcin, which is bone specific, has a major effect on energy expenditure, insulin secretion, insulin sensitivity, and most recently in testosterone production. So in summary, I've given you a very brief tour, thanks to a lot of investigators who contributed to this work. Um, and it highlights what NIH, and particularly NIAMS, have led the way in osteoporosis research. And this has occurred through a multifaceted approach, funding investigators from bench all the way to bedside. And our future discoveries will continue to span this basic work in clinical trials and comparative effectiveness. So thank you very much.